just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Shabbat Shalom, family. The reading from the book of Proverbs, coming from the 30th chapter, verses 4 through 6. Again, Proverbs 30, verses 4 through 6. And it reads, Who but Elohim goes up to heaven and come back down. Who holds the wind in his fist? Who wraps up the oceans in his cloak? Who has created the whole wide world? What is his name? And his son's name? Tell me if you know. Every word of Eloha proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. Do not add to his words or he 
may rebuke you and expose you as a liar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say God's word is so powerful, isn't it? Well, God's blessing on each of you. Shalom tonight as we come together to celebrate this new year. As mentioned in our scripture, let us lift up holy hands and praise to our holy God and our Father and our Son and our Savior Christ. Let us go to the throne room of grace. Father, we just thank you for another day, this opportunity to come out with these, your people. Lord, we're lifting up our hands and our praise who's worthy to receive it all. We give thanks how you called us out of the darkness to your marvelous light. We are so hilariously happy that you are God and our Father. You have sent your Son to save us all because we needed a Savior, and you provide everything that we need. You give us life. You give us breath. You give us family. You give us friends. You give us activities of our land. You give us your word for the light and the lamp into our feet. We just thank you for our past and the members of this congregation as we worship you and praise, honoring your word, being obedient. This festival, first day of the new year that we're celebrating, according to your calendar, help us to be obedient to your word, that you would get the praise and the honor in our name. Bless those, bless those under the sound of my voice. You know what we need as we begin this new year. Bless us with the things that we even thought about that you got waiting for us. All we have to do is ask, and you do above and beyond what we ask or think. Bless in a mighty way. Bless this worship service and all those who are involved. Hear our prayer, O Lord, grant our petition. In the master's name of our great God and Savior, Yahusha, our Savior. Hallelujah. 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 Our Old Testament scripture is coming from the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 23 through 25. It reads, then the Lord, Yahuwah, spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Hallelujah. first New Testament passage is coming from the book of Revelation, the 19th chapter, verses 1 through 6, and the 11th chapter. Again, Revelation, the 19th chapter, 1 through 6, then verse 11. After these things, I heard a loud voice of such a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to Yahuwah our Eloha, for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped Father Yah who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our Eloha, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the sound of many water, and as the sounds of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for our Elohim is omnipotent, and he reigns. Verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Hallelujah. On the second New Testament will come from the book of 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verses 16 and 17. Again, 1 Thessalonians, fourth chapter, 16 and 17. For the Lord, Yahusha himself, Yahuwah himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of Yah. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we, we who are still alive and remain on this earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet Father Yah 
in the air. Then we will be with Father Yah forever. Hallelujah.
Welcome everyone. Let's give them another hand praise. <laughs> At this time, if we have any first time visitors visiting with us this evening, if you would please stand that we may acknowledge you. Oh, it looks like we all family here. Let's give them a hand praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Shalom family. The Feast of Trumpets. Yom Teruah is the first of the fall biblical feasts. The most prominent activity of Yom Teruah is the blowing of the shofar, a trumpet made from a ram's horn to encourage reflection and repentance. The feast always occurs on the first day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, Tishri 1. This feast has become known as the Rosh Hashanah, or the civil new year. However, the biblical new year begins in Abib, Nisan, and all feasts start and end at sundown. Since the destruction of the Second Temple of Jerusalem in 70 CE, normative tradition has been that Rosh Hashanah is to be celebrated for two days because determining the date of the new moon is complicated. This year's feast begins at sunset on Wednesday, October 2nd, and ends at sunset on Friday, October 4th, 2024. Father Yah instructed Israel too, and this is a quote from Joel 2, 15 through 17. He instructed them to blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, and gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Followers of Christ see the biblical feast as a foreshadowing of the Messiah's work, what he has accomplished and will accomplish in the future. While the spring feast look back at Yeshua's first coming, the fall feast look forward to his second coming. Followers of Yahshua see the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, as the future day when the last trump will sound. Yeshua will again set his feet on this earth. The faithful will be resurrected and the long-awaited king of Israel will sit on the throne of his father David. Now, um, the injunction to the celebration of the Feast of Trumpets, I will be reading from Leviticus 23, 23 through 32. And it reads, the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. On the first day of the appointed month in early autumn, you will observe a day of complete rest. It will be an official day for the Holy Assembly, assembly, commemorative with loud trumpet blasts. You must do no ordinary work on that day. Instead, you are to present special gifts to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, be careful to celebrate the Day of Atonement on the 10th day of that same month. Nine days after the Festival of Trumpets, you must observe it as an official day for Holy Assembly, a day to deny yourselves and present special gifts to the Lord. Do no work during that entire day because it is the Day of Atonement when offerings of purification are made for you, making you right with the Lord your God. All who do not deny themselves that day will be cut off from God's people, and I will observe anyone among you who does any work on that day. And I, I'm going to quote that again. I will destroy 
anyone among you who does any work on that day. You must not do any work at all. This is a permanent law. I'm going to repeat that, a permanent law for you. And it must be observed from generation to generation, wherever you live. This will be a Sabbath day of complete rest for you. And on that day, you must deny yourselves. This day of rest will begin at sundown on the ninth day of the month and extend until sundown on the tenth day. Father Yah's provision of a ram. Quoted from Genesis 22 through 9, verses 9 through 20. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes. Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You must have not withhold from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yiri. The Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The trumpet to announce the return of the king. This is quoted from Numbers 29.1. Celebrate the festival of trumpets each year on the first day of the appointed month in early autumn. You must call an official day for holy assembly, and you may do no ordinary work. This will be read from Zechariah 14, 3 through 5. Then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will split apart, making a wide valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will move toward the north and half toward the south. You will flee through this valley, for it will reach across the Azal. Yes, you will flee, as you did from the earthquakes, in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. Hallelujah.
Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 2, 12, 31 through 32, and Deuteronomy, uh, and Deuteronomy 12, 31, 32, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Those are the scripture basis for the presentation today. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 2, and it reads, Moses commanded obedience, and now, Israel, listen carefully to these decrees and regulations that I'm about to teach you. Obey them so that you may live, so that you may enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add or subtract from these commands I'm giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord, your God, that I'm giving you. Deuteronomy 12, 31, 32, you must not worship the Lord your God the way of the nations worship their gods. For they perform for their gods every detestable act that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters as sacrifice to their gods. Be careful to obey all the commands I give you. You must not add or subtract from them. 1 Samuel 15, 22, but Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifice or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of ram. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Do not add, take away from Father Yah's eternal word. As I said earlier, you may not have heard me. Uh, this year, I inadvertently uh, uh, followed the Jewish calendar as opposed to the ecclesiastical or the Torah calendar. Um, however, we will get back on track. It's easy. And this is why this time you're going to see all the confusion. It's because... When our Israelite brothers and sisters went into Babylon, they came back changing the Hebraic names of the dates and months that Father Yah gave and instituted traditions that were not taught to them, but rather they picked up inherited from Babylon. As a result, we have two calendars running today, the so-called Jewish calendar, and the Torah calendar, another name for that e ecclesiastical calendar. Now, um, why do we celebrate the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah? We celebrate the Feast of Trumpet because Father Yah gave it to his people as a memorial. It is not a Jewish feast. It is Father Yah's feast. It is a holy convocation for his people and the time of a new beginning. Now, you will hear the term, uh, many of the European Jews, they will celebrate Rosh Hashanah. That is not difficult. I'm going to get into that a little later in the presentation. It is Yom Teruah. It is the shout. Leviticus 23 23 and 24, 25, it says as following. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall be a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. 25, you shall not do Servile work therein. Servile work means unnecessary work. 
If you are a fireman, if you're a policeman, you have to go to work. That's necessary work. But going to the mall to buy new shoes, new dress, that's survival. That's not necessary. We ought to do no unnecessary survival work. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. In the Bible, memorial is used as a reminder of something that served to preserve remembrance. When we look at uh, Strong's H, I believe it's 2146, you see the word Zacharond, uh, which means memorial, reminder of remembrance. One of the things, before I read Numbers 29, before I read that, Father Yah knows his people. He knows his people. He know them then and now that they will uh, that they are inclined to follow every trend, every traditions of men, while ignoring divine truth, biblical truth. Therefore, the feast of trumpets, like all the feasts, are a memorial to bring us to a point of remembrance. Remembering what Father Yah has done, what Father Yah is doing, and what he will do in the future. Numbers 29 and 1 says, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You should do no survival work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. You can see over and over again in Scripture the repetitive instruction. Since Yom Teruah means a great shout, even if you don't have a chauffeur, chauffeur, you can still shout. Hallelujah. Joshua 6 and 5 says, When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram horn, have the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Joshua 6.20 says, When the people heard the sound of the ram horn, they shouted as loud as they could and suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. Now, Father Yah's warning, do not err, do not take away. Listen to Joshua 1 and 6 and 7. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong, very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. 23, 26 of Joshua, be very firm. Then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you will not associate with these nations, these which remain among you, or nor mention the names of their gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. Over and over again, reminding Israel. Proverbs 30, 5 and 6. Every word of God is tested, meaning pure. It is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his word, or he will remove you, and you will be proved a liar. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says, I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone add to them, God would add to him the plagues which are written in these, this book. And if anyone take away from the word of this book of this prophecy, God would take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which is written in this book. Despite Father Yah's, despite Father Yah all his warnings, Israelite men and women added and took away 
from Father Yah's instruction. Do not turn from it. Father Yah's word means to the right nor to the left. Do not turn. You see, um, the enemies of true Israel followed the same practice. That is, to take away from the word, to hide the identity of African Israelites. Move to the next slide. As he warned, the enemy of true Israel followed the same practice of taking and adding from the word of the Most High. They followed the same practice in hiding the identity of African Israelites and to encourage their disobedience in following their pagan rituals, holidays, and religious practices. The teachings of Moses and Christ was hijacked and turned into systems not adhering to either of their teaching. What is not taught, as stated by Dr. Thomas Odom, and this is his book, and we did a Bible study in two of his books. This is the one here. It's called How Africans Shape the Christian Mind. He is a Caucasian theologian and historian but he's one who deals with truth. Listen to what Dr. Oden says. He says, the seed for scriptural interpretation that became common Christian teaching was first planted or sown in the African continent. He says, Africa shaped the Christian mind. The African theologian, John de Mditi, said Christianity in, uh, uh, excuse me, it should be, Christianity in, in Africa, in Africa, this should be Africa, is so old that the African theologian, John M. so old that it can be rightly described as indigenous, traditional, and African religion. I'll read that again, it's John M. Diddy. Christianity in Africa is so old that it can be rightly described as an indigenous, traditional, and African religion. So what does that mean? We have heard erroneously that Christianity is the product of Europeans. That is not true. When you really search and deal with history, you will discover long before theologians in Europe ever pin one word you had African theologian who wrote in the Coptic languages and even the language of the Ethiopian indigenous people, they wrote. See, you had people like uh, the Thebian born, Thebian that, that's in Egypt, Thebian born Pocopius, um, uh, yeah, Pocomius, uh, the Nubian born uh, Octatus. Uh, Shanut of Atreid and the Ethiopian theologian uh, Gerogis of Sila all laid the foundation for Christianity today. Now, Procomius, let me just say on him, Procomius is an uh, incredible theologian. Long before European engaged in what we call monasticism, he was the first one to develop a communal monastic order and wrote rules for monasticism. Europeans didn't come to this till much, much later, hundreds and years later. But this was already being practiced in Africa. Yes. Yeah. Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 2 says, Moses command obedience, and, and now listen. Listen, Israel. Israel, listen carefully to these decrees and regulations that I'm about to teach you. Obey them so that you may live, so you may, in, so you may enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. As believers in Christ and children of the God of Abraham, 
Isaac and Jacob. We are not to adapt the religious practice of people around us not taught in scripture. Disobedient men have changed what Father Yah has instructed and have had us following the traditions of men, traditions not found and taught in scripture, such as Christmas, Easter, and Sunday worship. You cannot find this in scripture. This is a prefabrication of Eurocentric Christianity. That Christianity was not birthed in Africa, but rather in the minds of those Eurocentric theologians who had a, a, a tendency, a proclivity towards changing the word, hiding truth so as to keep us in a stupor of theological and spiritual ignorance. So we follow their traditions, not the traditions of scripture. That is why it's so hard to get our people to embrace the word of the Most High. Yes, yes, it is so difficult because they think when you follow divine truth, you're in a little cult. That's the brainwashing. That's the tradition that we inherited that has engulfed our mind and our consciousness. Again, we adapted the religious practice of those who enslaved our people, those who neither obeyed Father Yah's instruction nor practiced the love ethics of Christ, whom they said they served. Therefore, the tradition we once followed were Eurocentric pagan traditions that were not supported by Scripture. When you read Scripture through your traditions and theological lens, you will never see divine truth or bring your life in compliance with Father Yah's word, will, and purpose. All you will ever see is the truth of your denomination and your theology. When you read scripture through your denomination lens, through your tradition, through your theology, you will never discover divine truth. I read the scripture through the lens of my Baptist denomination. I read the scripture through the lens of my theology. That is why I was blind. That's why I was ignorant to the divine truth of the Most High, even with the seminary degree. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we thank Father Yah for the awakening, moving the scales from our eyes, moving the scales from our intellectual capacity to understand divine truth emanating from his word. Yes. One of the detestable practices of the Canaanite worship was burning their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to Molech. You'll find this in Jeremiah 32, 35. Listen again to Deuteronomy 12, 31, 32. You must not worship the Lord your God the way other nations worship their gods. For they perform for their gods every detestable act that the Lord hates. They even burn their children, their sons and daughters as sacrifices to their gods. So be careful to obey all the commands I give you. You must not add or subtract from them. Observe what happened to Israel when they turned from scripture and followed traditions of men. Before the Babylonian captivity during the days of the kings, the seventh month was called Ethnonym. First Kings 8 and 2 says, And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethnonym, which is the seventh month. Watch this. Israel went into Babylon 
calling the seventh month Ethnim, meaning strong, but came out of Babylon calling the seventh month Tishrei. See what happened to pagan influences? Changing the word. Likewise, Israel went into Babylon calling the first month Abib and came out of Babylon calling the first month Nisan. You will never find that word in Scripture. The Hebrew text, it is Abib. All right. Abib and Ethanim, Hebrew words, were replaced with Babylonian words and their definition. Babylon is more than a historical city and empire. Babylon symbolizes a religious, political, and economic system that opposes Father Yah authority and instructions. Babylon is the great prostitute ruling the world on the end time who made the inhabitants of the earth drink with the wine of a fornication. But Father Yah will bring his wrath of judgment on Babylon. Some of the most significant festivals or feasts occurs during the month of Ethnim, the seventh month, including the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the, day, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. These festivals or feasts are crucial for Israel communal and spiritual life, serving as a time for repentance, renewal, and remembrance of Father Yah provision. The word Tishrei is a Babylonian influence. Influence identified on the internet as Rosh Hashanah. Tishrei is not found in the Bible. When you search Wikipedia, uh, you will see Tishrei months of beginnings is the first month of the silver year which they call, the European Jews call uh, the Jewish New Year Rosh Hashanah. That is not what Father Yah taught. That ain't scripture. And look at this again. Tishri is not found in the Bible. When you search Wikipedia, Tishri, uh, it's spelled two ways. The uh, months of beginning is the first month of the silver year, which starts on one Tishrei and the uh, and the seventh month of the ecclesiastical year, which began on Nisan on the Hebrew calendar. Again, two calendars: so-called Jewish calendar and then the Torah calendar. All right, for Passover we'd be back on the Torah calendar, which is the correct calendar. For Father Yah's people. Hallelujah. As Arthur Bailey states, Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, is the feast where false prophets, prophecies, and Jewish traditions are on full display for the whole world to see the massive confusion surrounding the biblical holiday. So, why do people reject Father Yah's instruction? People ignore, desert, and add to its instruction to be free to do as they please, even when their actions are not validated in Scripture. Father Yah clearly teaches, do not adopt religious practices of the people around you not taught in Scripture. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Why is it so hard for Father Yah people to turn to the truth of this holy word? Why is it so difficult? Why we cannot bring ourselves to read his word? 
follow the instructions and come out of the traditions of men. We can't find any of the tradition that we once practiced in the scriptures. Even when they fictitiously tried to put Easter in the Bible, the outcry was so great, they took it out because they knew it was a lie. Therefore, you will not find in the modern Bibles the word Easter. That's a man-made prefabrication such as Christmas, which is a pagan tradition of drunken celebration called Saturnalia. Our Savior was not born in December. He was born in the lambing season when lambs are born. In the month of Abib, which is the first month on the Torah calendar. That is Israel New Year, not Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> this is a time that we reflect, we repent. This leads right into what? Yom Kippur, where we atone for all of our sins. If you're reading, Second Ezra chapter 7 by now, you will understand. Get on your knees and repent for everything you have ever done. When you read the judgment that is coming, if you're in your right mind, you'll be on your knees throwing your hands up saying, God, forgive me for every thought, every deed, every action that I ever committed. Hallelujah. If you are not terrified, if you get through reading that, then something wrong with your soul. Yes. So why do people ignore the desert and the instructions? Because they want to be free. They want to be free to be lawless. To teach people in ignorance. That we are not on the law, but on the grace. What does that mean? The law is grace. It teaches us how to live in fellowship, righteously connected with the Heavenly Father and with each other. It teaches us how to live as members of his divine family. Christ said, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came to do what? To feel. I came to give you the moral interpretation. So what does Jesus practice? What did he practice? What did he follow? What did he keep? You say you're believers. You're disciples of Christ. Well, then worship like he worshiped. Obey what he obeyed. Live by the principle that he lived. If we say we are following Christ and he is our Savior, we worship like him. We praise like him. We serve like him. And we follow the instructions that he followed. Religions are man-made traditions. To do what? To control the narrative of how you think about God, how you process that in your daily walk. Religion can never save because it was never instituted by God. It is the product of men. If you want salvation, you need a relationship, not religion. A relationship with the heavenly father, provision of your salvation, Yahusha, the Amashia. Yes. So we must do what? Come out of Babylon. Come out of the traditions of men. Come out of the Eurocentric Christian pagan tradition. Once again, African, the continent of Africa, 
is the soil where the seed of Christianity, the teachings of Christ, were planted. And it came from the pen of black theologians. Not even talking about Tertullian, not talking about Augustine, but not even talking about these men. Even before them, it was Africa, not Europe. Africa gave birth to Christianity. That is the teachings of Christ. I didn't say Eurocentric Christianity. I said the teachings of Christ. Christ obeyed the law. Christ obeyed the commandments. He gave you the moral interpretation. He wants you to have it where? In the conscience of your mind. You've heard, they just not kill, but I say if you hate, you'll murder. That's spiritual. That's the mental. That's the cognitive understanding. Did not come to destroy. He came to fulfill, to give you the moral interpretation that you may internalize that truth in your heart, in your spirit. And he said, You shall know the truth, and it does what shall set you free. Let me bring this to an end. The Hebrew prophets often speak about how obedience is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice is only needed because of what? Disobedience. Not keeping the law, the Torah, requires another. So when you're not keeping the law, it requires another law in place. That's the sacrifice to do what? To atone for sin. If you obey, you don't need to sacrifice. If Adam had not sinned, Father, y'all would not have to sacrifice an animal to cover the shame of that neckness. But sacrificing became essential as a means to atone for sin. Though the law cannot save, it was never designed to save. It was to keep us as a family until Father, our provision of salvation, the ultimate and only sacrifice would come to do what the blood of animals could not do once and forever. Yes, yes, yes. So the law, commandments are to be observed. But the law is not a mean of salvation. Never intended to be. It was our schoolmaster until Christ Yahushua come because Father Yah knew our proclivity towards sin and our inability to obey and keep the commandment. Therefore, a provision for salvation was made even before the foundation of the world. Pharisee. Behold the hands, behold the nail. Yes, yes. King Saul of Israel disobeyed God Elohah's command. He taught that by altering God's or Elohah's command, he somehow developed a better solution than what God had outlined. Therefore, this is the context for the statement. Obedience is better than sacrifice by the prophet Samuel. Obedience is always better than disobedience in the Old Testament and New Testament. When Samuel said obedience is better than sacrifice, what he is saying to King Saul is, you should have obeyed God, Elohah, instead of disobeying him and bringing all these animals for sacrifice. What good is a sacrifice when you're disobedient? Therefore, we should take away the lesson, obey God, rather than develop your solutions. Is the Lord pleased as much with burnt offerings or burnt gifts as he is when he is obeyed? See, it is better to obey than to give gifts. It is better to listen than to give the fat of ram. Yes, obedience is better than sacrifice. Believers in Christ 
have perfect obedience and sacrifice, they are manifest in the Savior, Yahusha. His sacrifice was once and for all and is valuable for all who believe in him and follow him. First Samuel tell us to make obedience our top priority. Then our sacrifice will come out of reverence for the Heavenly Father. Passages throughout the Bible share this same principle, Hosea 6 and 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. Proverbs 21, 3 says, To do righteous and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Therefore, our instructions are not to add or to remove from what Father Yah has commanded. The Feast of Trumpet is not a Jewish feast. It is Father Yah's feast for his people. John 5, 1 and 5 says, Whoever believe in Yahusha, the Christ, is born of God. And everyone who loved him, who begot, also loved him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not what? Burdensome. For whoever is born of God overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcome the world? But he who believes that Yahusha is the Son of God. This is 1 John 5, verse 1 through 5. 1 John 5, 1 through 5. As we observe the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, let this be the start of a new beginning. Let this be a time of repentance. Renewal, remembrance of Father Yah's provision. Let this be a time of reminding us of the importance of obedience and giving thanks to Father Yah for a new beginning made new in Christ. Even if you have fallen into negative patterns of disobedience, the Feast of Trumpet is a time for new beginning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yum Teruah. Hallelujah. <laughs>
song because he is good all the time. And all the time, he is good. Let's give our great God a round of applause. Let's applause for our pastor, our teacher, this mighty man of God. Let's give him a mighty word for the, the lesson he taught us today. We're so thankful that God inspired him that we get on the Hebrew calendar. Bless him. Let's always lift him up in prayer. Let us all stand for where we say, uh, recite our liturgy of the table. Hopefully, they put it up on the... Uh, they don't have it, but most of us know it by heart. Set apart by your covenant, redeemed through Christ's sacrifice, and renewed by the refreshing winds of your living spirit. We come bearing our gifts, O merciful Yah. They are but a portion of earth's treasure you abundantly give us. With them, we commit our time and energy to be Christ's faithful servants. Use all that we bring and all that we are to bless your holy name through Yahshua the Hamashiach. Hallelujah. Now in the hands of our, uh, let them remain standing in the hands of our uh, urchers and follow their direction as we come and give our offering to the Lord. Pray that you've been informed and understand why we come and celebrate Yah Yam Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. It's a memorial to remind us of who God is, where He has brought us from, and what He is calling us to. He is calling us to a life of obedience to His Word. He is calling us to a life of repentance. And Father Yah is looking at us. He is counting on us to share his word, his message with others, with their families. I know it's hard for them to give up these traditions, but help them to understand and see in scripture the divine truth so they can understand truth from falsehood. Yeah. Traditions of men versus biblical instructions. And so may Father God bless you. May he continue to increase wealth, your health, and continue to bless you and your family. May he be good to you and be gracious to you. May the Lord God lift up his face upon you. May he be gracious to you, lift up his conscience upon you, and give you peace. Hallelujah. Shalom. 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 Shalom.